This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Laura Decker was born on a boat and from a young age dreamed of sailing the globe. With the support of her parents, she was ready to set sail at age 13, only to be stopped by Dutch authorities. After the legal battles ended, she won her fight and set off on her solo journey at age 14. 366 days later, she successfully completed her solo circumnavigation in January of 2012 and became the youngest person to do so. She now calls New Zealand her home and has written a book about her adventures titled A Girl, A Dream. Laura Decker, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thank you. Laura, how did you end up being born on a boat? Um, well, my dad is a very fanatic sailor and started building a boat at a very young age. Finished it when he was uh, in his early 20s. And then uh, married my mom and I sailed for seven years around the world. So uh, I was born halfway uh, that trip in New Zealand. At what age did you start sailing yourself? I started sailing alone when I was about six in an optimist, so little children's boats. Laura, how much preparation went into getting ready to embark on the solo uh, sailing expedition? Um, yeah, that's a bit of a difficult question because I think I started preparing for that trip when I started to uh, sail solo. So every time I was in the water, I, I learned more and I've sailed so much that, of course, all of that helped me to get on the way because the knowledge part is, uh, is the biggest part, I guess. And the preparation on the boat um, took about half a year, but working on it every day uh, a lot. How did you end up with the boat that you named Guppy? Well, my dad found it uh, very cheap. It was repossessed. I had a look at it, and the whole looked uh, looks pretty good. My dad's a boat builder, so uh, together we uh, we thought we could uh, fix the boat up and uh, get it seaworthy. How much work does that entail? What do you all have to do? Well, my boat needed quite a bit of work. Uh, I'd been standing on shore uh, for seven years. So I needed a whole new engine, new sails, new rigging. Uh, we put a new rudder under it, made a whole new rudder for it. And uh, some structural damage that we that we repaired or, or made stronger. And then all the gear, of course, that goes onto the boat. Why did you call it Guppy? I was often called Guppy when I was younger, and when I got my first seaworthy boat when I was 10, um, it was quite a big boat for for me at that age, so I called the boat Guppy. And after that, all the boats that I had, I, uh, I just called them Guppy as well. So you were ready to set sail, and please correct me if I'm wrong, at age 13, but... Yes. Yep. Then something happened with the Dutch authorities and you were prevented from continuing. So how did that affect your mindset and how long did that take before you were finally able to get going? Um yeah, that's right. I was able of I was ready to set out and then the uh, the Dutch authorities stopped me. Um and I f- Fighted, um, not sure about eight uh, court battles over ten months. So yeah, by the time I was ready to leave, I was fourteen, and um, yeah, so the the whole journey uh, was postponed for a year, and it was especially tough for me because um, the whole media jumped on top of it, and not quite positively, and I I wasn't really prepared for it because. I just wanted to make this trip um, because I wanted to do it and not to get into the media or make money out of it or uh, anything like that. So it was quite a big shock for me that the whole world jumped on top of it. 
And ultimately, what did the Dutch authorities finally say to you at the end? At the end, they gave the um, responsibility of uh, my parent uh, of about me back to my parents because they had taken it off my parents at the beginning of the court cases. And um, yeah, when it was given back, I was able to leave. But uh, the case never actually had a end. Laura, let's talk about the the journey, and yes. it's it's quite long, of course. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to read through what I think is your itinerary, and if I make any big mistakes, please correct me. Okay. And then we can go back and we can talk, maybe hit some of the highlights for you of that trip. So you started you started solo on August 22nd of 2010 from Gibraltar. Yes. You go from Gibraltar to the Cape Verde Islands? I uh, made a, a stop in the Canary Islands. And then you go from Cape Verde to St. Martin? Yes. And St. Martin to the Panama Canal? Um, yeah, I, I did have a few stops in the islands in between, but... That's pretty much, yeah. And then the Las Perlas Islands to the Galapagos Islands. Yeah. And Galapagos to the Marquesas Islands. Yes. And then the Marquesas to Tahiti. Mm-hmm. Tahiti to Bora Bora. Yes. Bora Bora to Tonga. Yep. Tonga to Fiji. Mm-hmm. Fiji to Vanuatu. Yeah. Then from there, you go to Darwin, Australia. Yes. Then to Durban, South Africa, Mm -hmm. around the Cape of Good Hope to Cape Town, yeah, and from Cape Town back to St. Martin. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) So of that trip, which took 366 days, yeah, what are some of the high points for you along the way? Well, I, um, yeah, (laughs) good question. Of course, in the beginning, everything is more exciting and new places, of course. And then after a while, you get more used to it. But I found, um, looking back now, I found the Pacific Islands beautiful. But then arriving the first time in the Caribbean was uh, really exciting and a big point for me, of course, after crossing first big ocean. There were, yeah, there were many, many beautiful um, highlights in in, the And my journey, actually. Did you, were you prepared for everything that you came upon in your journey throughout your training? Or did you have to learn things along the way? Well, yeah, I think you just learn things along the way. Uh, I, I learned a lot on the way, but then I sailed a lot before it as well. So I came across things there, but. That could have happened on the trip as well, I guess. But you simply just can't be prepared for everything. You can't foresee uh, every little thing or, or be prepared for that. So sometimes you just have to think how to solve something. And yeah, that uh, was no problem for me. Can you give me an example of of a, a big problem that happened that you had to solve? Well, I had... Of course, it's a, it's a boat, and a lot of things break. There were heaps of things I had to solve, like sails rip, and then you have to uh, repair them again. My steering wheel fell off, and then with pieces of wood and some rope, uh, I managed to get it back on and keep it there and get back into our marina, and the shaft of the rudder got completely stuck, so you have to get it going again. And Yeah, a lot of little things like that. What was the longest of these ocean crosses that you had to do? Uh, the longest time I was on sea non-stop was 48 days. And that was from Darwin to Durban. Yeah, it was a rough trip, but I, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, mentally, it was, uh, it was very nice. Enjoyed it a lot. What is it about it that you enjoy? I think I just enjoyed the um, 
the peace and being one with nature, even though it was a very rough trip with starting with two weeks of no winds, which drives you a bit insane, and then a couple of fronts coming over from rum directions. But um, just uh, the time and see after, after two, three weeks, the time just kind of disappears and the days go by. And uh, I just loved... Yeah, surviving out there with with just uh, the winds and the waves and no one around me. That uh, it was very nice for me. But then at the same time, coming back on land is is also a very nice thing. What's it like to live in a boat like that for that long crossing? I mean, to to take care of yourself and to feed yourself and, and to sl- try to sleep. I found it very peaceful because it's a very easy way of living, but at the other hand, very intense because there's constantly something going on. You're constantly moving and looking at the sails and looking where you're going and if everything is going right. But then at the other hand, there's not much. There's no one you have to talk to, no one, nothing other than your boat that you really have to care about. And yeah, you just have to care about your food, where you're heading, if the boat is all right, and uh, and get some sleep. So on the one hand, very intense, but on the other hand, very peaceful as well. I found it a very nice balance. I loved it. Do you think it takes a certain type of person to do this kind of a trip? Does it Yes, definitely. Yeah. How would you describe that person? Well, you shouldn't be too attached to uh having people around or needing to talk to someone. Um there is some people who really uh enjoy company a lot and and just can't really go without it. And then there is people who just like being on their own every once in a while, just have some space to think and and be out there. So I'm definitely one of these people, but I also do enjoy uh, company every now and then. But I think mainly you just uh, need to be able to enjoy solitude. What happens when you enter a new port? Can you kind of take us through the process of what you have to do during that period of time? Well, firstly, uh, you sit on a boat and you see an island appearing on the horizon and it takes about half a day from the time that you see the island first until you get there. So it's quite exciting, especially after such a long time to see land again. So you get all excited. Um, I mostly uh, clean up the boat a bit, get ready, um, yeah, do, do some little things on the boat, uh, transferring it into more a living living space than, than sailing. And then you're slowly getting closer, um, looking for all the immigration papers and stuff, and then getting the anchor and everything ready. And then slowly uh, putting down the sails, getting into port, which is also, for, for me, it was always a really exciting thing because uh, it was most of the time new ports. So, yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing. And then you get there, and then the first thing that you have to do is is go to customs and immigration, and to declare yourself and the boat in, and then uh, find a nice place to anchor. I read your blog, and you often complained about the paperwork that you had to do for the customs and immigration. Um, yeah. <laughs> why is there so much paperwork? You think? Well, I, I, they just want to know who. Uh, it, it's the same as when you come in with a plane, of course. Um, they like to know uh, who comes in and what comes in. And especially with a boat, there is a lot of stuff that people can bring in. So they, uh, they're they quite strict on it and they often check the boat as well. Did you make any friends along the way when you set into a new port? Yeah, I made heaps of friends on the way, actually. Uh, a couple of really, really close friends now. And a lot of people on the way that uh, it's just a good chat. But yeah, it, it's definitely not like I was alone all the time. There's so many people that cruise around with their boat everywhere in the world. It's, it's, it's easy to get in touch with people. And I also found that 
the local people in, in the, for instance, the Caribbean and the Pacific were very friendly and very inviting. So it's, it's definitely not hard to make contact with people. Did you have an opportunity to do any fun things when you uh, were at a new location? Yeah, um, more after the trip when I kept going, but also during the trip sometimes. Uh, most of the time, though, I s- got on land and then spent a couple days to get the boat um, up and going again for the next passage. So repair things that broke down, um, do some research in the next passage and uh, things like that. But yeah, there's definitely days that uh, that I did nice nice things as well, yeah. So how do you get from your your boat, which is anchored, to the land? Uh, with a dinghy, just uh, with a small inflatable uh, boat. Uh, does it have an engine? Um, I did have a small engine. Uh, I didn't use it often. I mostly just pedaled, yeah. Part of what you did was you got involved with some of the things on these tall ships, like the Stad Amsterdam. Yeah. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, that was quite cool. Actually, they they were in St. Martin at the same time as me, and I got in contact with them. And then they were going for a cruise, and they, uh, they invited me to come on board as crew. So, uh, yeah, I just worked on the ship as crew for uh, for two weeks cruising around the islands uh that was uh that was a very cool experience it's uh very different than my boats of course uh really big square sails um heaps of ropes and then also going from a boat where i'm on my own and then a lot of other people uh which was good fun actually yeah Oh, so also during this trip of course you're going to be in part of the world where there's an issue with pirates Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't want to give, don't give away any of your secrets, but what are the things that sailors need to think about when they're getting into these, these waters and how do you deal with it? Yeah, I think it's a bit, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky question because that's different for everyone, I guess. I, I just mainly try to avoid all these uh, areas. So I didn't go through the Red Sea uh, in the Indian Ocean which is at the moment quite a risk area. I turned off my tracking system and just kept a very good lookout. But yeah, mainly just trying to avoid areas where where they are, I guess. I didn't have too many problems with it. That's good. Yeah. Now your friend, I read that your friend Jillian is making a film about this journey. Yes. What, what can you tell me about how that's going? I am not really um, sure, actually. Uh, we started to document a trip, and uh, she made a documentary of it and edited it. And we started to work on it together quite a bit, but then there were some things that she wanted to have in it that I uh, wanted to have a bit different. So I just gave the whole thing back to her, and um, she is finishing it off now. You're also involved in some, I guess I could call them um, a charitable thing, like the Y for Youth. Yeah. Tell me about that. How how did you get involved with it? Yeah, so Y for Youth, they um, they tried to get a sustainable funding to um, just to help programs for uh, for kids, and they contacted me just after I arrived in New Zealand, actually. And told me what they were doing, and um, yeah, I was quite quite happy to get involved, especially because um, I was involved with childcare in Holland, of course, and I've seen a lot of things that are not right here. And uh, they told me a lot of things that were going on in New Zealand uh, with kids not growing up quite right, and that they were trying to um, to help them. So. I got involved as an ambassador and uh, do speaking and uh, that kind of things. Now, you also were awarded the 2012 Challenger of the Year Award from the Faust Adventurers Guild? Yes, that's right. And you went to Tokyo to receive that? Yeah. 
Tell me about that. That was an awesome experience. Yeah, they emailed me that I had that award and uh, if I was willing to come over to Tokyo to uh, to collect it. So that was a, a, an interesting experience, actually being between uh, Japanese people and uh, a very different culture. I hadn't stopped on my trip in uh, in Japan or in any Asian country. So it was a very different culture for me already in the uh, yeah, I, I found it quite cool. I was in Tokyo for only a couple of days, but um, they were very friendly, and uh, yeah, it was it was a very good experience. There were a lot of people that uh, that got awards there on that day, and uh, quite quite amazing things actually. There was a really old lady who wanted to climb every highest mon- mountain in uh, every country in the world. And she was in her 70s. Uh, it was quite amazing. Amazing things going on there. Was that your first time in Tokyo? Yes. Yeah. First time in, in an Asian country, actually. What did you think of Tokyo? I thought <laughs> it, was, um, it was a bit of a culture shock. It's really busy and... It's just everything is flashing and moving and people are just seem to run around. I think if you get in there and don't really get what's going on, it's, um, yeah, it's just too much, actually, I found. But it's really interesting. It's such a different culture and such a different way of thinking. Laura, how did this round-the-world circumnavigation, how did it change you as a person? Well, in a lot of ways. I mean, I started when I was 14 and I'm almost 18 now. And, well, I've lived on Guppy and sailed around all that time. So, first of all, of course, I grew up a lot. And I think the trip generally around the world, it just gave me a very good perspective of places in the world and I found it very nice to see different cultures and compare them to each other. And it helped me a lot to get a good view of what I like and how the world is working and just what kind of different places there are. I I think it's always good to get more of a global view than when you're living in one place your whole life. Then you can't really say anything (laughs) <laughs> about the rest of the world. So it's for me it was very nice to to see all these different cultures and and think about that. Someday there will be another young woman that follows you. What advice do you have for her? Well, I don't know. It doesn't necessarily have to be sailing, of course, but if you mean the sailing part, I guess it's it's good to be prepared, know what you're doing. I had a lot of help from my parents because they taught me everything. They um, taught me safety and how to navigate and how to sail and what to look after. And, of course, they had seven years of experience. So I guess I, I had a good background. But preparation is definitely the most important thing, I, I think, for everything preparing well and thinking about what can go wrong and how things go uh, was a very important part for me. And yeah, putting a lot of effort and time into my boat to make it safe and prepare it for things that can happen or just get it real seaworthy. That definitely helped me a lot on the trip. I want to take take a step back for a second because I remember now in your blog you talked about one time using a sextant for navigation yeah so i was surprised that that old form of navigation is still in use not much no if you go further into sailing you will still have to learn it because it's still the best way to navigate if everything else fails if the gps fails if the satellite falls out The sextant will always work. It doesn't use power or anything. So people still learn how to use it, but it's not used often. 
mostly people just take a couple GPSs on the boat and then they're good. Laura, you wrote a book. It's called, well, in English, it would be called A Girl, A Dream. Is there any future plans to publish this in English? I am really hoping to publish it in English, yes. But so far, I haven't found an English publisher or anyone who is willing to translate it for a reasonable or payable price for me. So, yeah, I'm I'm mainly just looking for an English publisher who can translate the book as well, as I have written it in Dutch and it will be published in German uh, next month. Well, good luck with that. And I think, yeah, it's only a matter of time, I think, before you find an English publisher. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. It, uh, it'd be really great if I could publish it in English. Laura, what is next for you? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, there is, I, I'm, there's still so many things I want to do. I'd love to um, to get a strong boat and, and sail to the North Pole or the Antarctic and explore some some different parts of the world. But yeah, sailing is definitely in the in in the future plans. A lot of uh, traveling, sailing, um, so but uh, not a set plan yet. What's going to happen to Guppy? Well, I still own Guppy. I still live on Guppy. So um, for now, I don't have any plans to uh, to sell her, get rid of her. How can people contact you? Uh, over my website. There is an uh, email address on my website and um, also a guest book. What, so. is, what is your website address? Uh, it's www.lauradecker.com. Laura Decker, thank you so much for talking to me and making the time available. I really appreciate it. No problem. Congratulations on your accomplishment and good luck in your future plans. Thank you very much. Recorded August 18, 2013. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. <laughs>